Hi everyone, welcome to our Tuesday TNT. Now, for many people, it's still a Songkran holiday, but there is a lot of traffic, people moving back to town. Started last night. Uh, let's go to some of the, uh, the vision. CowsideEnglish.com says people are returning gradually to Bangkok. Now the long Songkran holidays ended. This was uh, last night. Mita Prap Road is jam-packed with traffic. Highway police in Nakhon Ratchasima and Saraburi provinces have opened special routes. And according to police, eight express lanes on the Pahon Yotan Road inbound to Bangkok have been activated. So sort of into our post-Songkran mop-up. Let's uh, find out a little bit more. Khao San Road did very well, and we go to Thai PBS World. Four days Songkran Festival brought 500 million baht to Khao San Road. Wonder who counted that? And the president of the Khao San Road Business Association said the revenue growth can be attributed to an increase in the number of international tourists and the fact that the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration organised events in both Khao San Road and Sanam Luang. He said there were 600 street vendors throughout the festival and the total number of visitors was estimated at 400,000 people over the four-day period. And as Songkran celebrations in Khao San Road came to a close at midnight, a team of more than 30 cleaners were assembled to help clear the road of plastic bottles, packaging and rubbish, and the road surface was later sprayed with water to wash off the white scented powder used in the water fights. But no additional revellers were allowed to enter Khao San Road from midnight onwards, but those who were already in the area were permitted to party on until the pub's closing times. Well, that would have been at least 4 a.m., probably later, so cleaners would have had to have just fit in between the, uh, the celebrations. But, of course, there is a sad side to the Songkran holidays uh, each year, the most dangerous time out on Thailand's roads. We go to BangkokPost.com, Thai New Year road accidents claim 162 lives. Now, this goes from April the 11th to the 14th, noting that today's the 16th, uh, this is the latest figures we have that says 162 lives uh, were lost and 1,279 people injured. And Nakhon Si Tamarat had the highest traffic accidents, 50, and the highest number of those injured at 54. Bangkok and Royette recorded the highest death toll, each 10 people. And on Sunday, April the 14th, there was 317 traffic accidents, 38 fatalities and 311 people injured. On that day, Nan saw the highest number of accidents, 14 and 16 injured. And Nakhon Sawan recorded the highest death toll at three. Now, with a lot of journalists away and a lot of other people and public servants away, it does take a bit of time for these numbers to filter through. Hence the fact that uh, these Sunday tolls are now just uh, coming to the media. And the Director General of the Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation said yesterday that the number of accidents, fatalities and injured people was lower than during last year's Songkran Festival. And interesting to note, between 11th and the 14th of April, there were nearly 4,000 cases of traffic violations. Drink driving formed 96% of them. And UN figures show that, in fact, an average of about 55 people die every day of the year following accidents on Thai roads. An ongoing disgrace for the Thai government, and really, over the 13 years I've been here, I've seen nothing concrete that will do anything to put a dent in this horrific road toll. Now, an interesting story today out of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. I'll put a link in the description to this and the next story because they're both very long but quite interesting reports. I'll just try and get to the synthesis, the synthesis of both of them. This one says, mobilising against Thai hydropower, information is power. And it says the explosive growth of development along the Mekong River since 1995 has produced an estimated 167 hydropower plants with 11 mainstream facilities on the way in Laos, Cambodia and along the Laos-Thailand border. And just the same little bit of editorial advice I'd give to these writers, as I've suggested to patiamail.com, uh, paragraphs just make it a whole lot easier to read. With its electricity generating capacity projected to triple from 10 to 30,000 megawatts by 2040, 
hydropower will continue to play a key role in the regional energy initiatives. Now, despite these gains, hydropower has come at substantial social and environmental cost. And the implementation of cascading dam releases, which disrupt the Mekong's natural pulse, is expected to lead to $23 billion US dollar loss in fisheries by 2040, but the destruction of wetlands and other riverine habitats due to sediment depletion could result in losses of up to 145 billion US dollars. And these challenges have a direct impact on rural Thai communities, many of which are jeopardised by declining fish populations that serve as a primary source of food and income. And the report goes on to conclude that hydropower is not a clean, uh, renewable energy, but instead increases methane production, riverbank erosion and sediment and fish depletion throughout the Mekong sub-region. Now this environmental degradation has been going on for decades now. According to this report, 167 plants, uh, hydropower plants with more on the way. Not just the construction of these plants, but the actual day-to-day -day running of the plants continues to degrade one of the world's most important river deltas. I'll put a link in the description of this video. And uh, it was talking about fisheries, so we'll go to this next story, which I'll also provide a link in the description. And uh, reported by Channel News Asia, a new era of slaves. Thailand's plan to loosen fishery laws renews fear of illegal fishing, forced labour. And Thailand's proposing sweeping changes to fishery laws that could weaken penalties for illegal fishing and the protection of workers, reversing gains made several years ago and threatening billions of dollars worth of trade. Their comments made by opponents the story goes on saying reduced penalties for illegal, unreported and unregulated unreg fishing, the deregulation of destructive fishing gear such as trawling nets, reintroducing the banned practice of transshipment of seafood at sea and the relaxation of regulations on catching protected marine species. And jail terms would be eliminated for all IUU offences and some fines could be decreased by 98%. For example, the maximum fine for fishing in a marine protected area could be reduced from approximately $825,000 currently to just $13,750. And some draft bills, including re-allowing the transfer of boat crews at sea and removing requirements for vessels to provide crew lists before leaving port. And these raise concerns about workers' welfare and the heightened risk of human trafficking. Now, the fishing industry was rife with human trafficking and slavery before these laws were passed. And it looks like there are some Thai politicians that want to wind them back, but not just wind them back a little bit, but a lot. And while different parties in the National Cabinet have proposed different law changes, which are currently being negotiated, they agree the current legislation is too strict on commercial fishers. And a member of the Move Forward Party said we're aware that there was a problem then for fisheries and labour and nobody wants to go back to that point. But right now the law leaves no flexibility. But some global seafood brands and non-governmental organisations have written to the Prime Minister concerned that weaker regulations would harm Thailand's reputation as well as the long-term viability of its fisheries sector. A quite a long and detailed report from Channel News Asia in Singapore. I'll put a link in the description of this video. The situation in the Middle East continues to be tense as we await some sort of response, either verbal or otherwise, from Israel. But it has caused a, a lot of confusion and problems with uh, flight routes. So Bangkok Post has gone through uh, some of the airlines and what's happened with them. And they report a list of flight cancellations due to Middle East tensions. And Iran's missile and drone attacks on Israel on Friday further narrowed options for airlines navigating between Europe and Asia. While Israel, Jordan, Iraq and Lebanon reopened their airspace on Sunday, some routes continued to be affected. A Germany's Lufthansa has suspended its regular flights to and from uh, Tel Aviv and that will be up to at least yesterday. And KLM cancelled all flights to and from Tel Aviv until today. 
Uh, Britain's EasyJet on Sunday paused operations to and from Tel Aviv. Uh, no particular timeline on that. Wizz Air said it cancelled most flights to and from Tel Aviv until at least yesterday. Finnair suspended operations in Iranian airspace until further notice. United Airlines cancelled Sunday's planned flight from Newark to uh, Tel Aviv. Air Canada warned of long delays and cancellations. They've cancelled flights uh, on yesterday and today. Qantas has uh, temporarily rerouted flights between Perth and London and Air India decided to temporarily halt flights to Tel Aviv. Some of the other reports there uh, have gone past this particular time. Etihad Airways cancelled services to Tel Aviv, Israel and uh, Amman, Jordan on Sunday. Emirates Airlines resumed scheduled operations to and from Jordan, Lebanon and Iraq from Sunday afternoon and Qatar Airways also resumed services to Amman, Beirut and Baghdad. Well, obviously, if you are flying around at the moment, especially across that part of the world, uh, maybe from Asia to Europe or Europe back to Asia or any of those ports in between, you probably need to check with your airline to see if there are any changes. Now to much closer tensions right here on the Thai border between Thailand and Myanmar. We go to nationthailand.com. Myanmar rebels say they've repelled junta push to take back border town. And a resistance group fighting Myanmar's military rule uh, says its fighters had repelled an attempt by junta troops to advance on the key town of Miawadi along the Thai border that was seized by rebels last week. And Junta forces have been trying to advance on Miawadi for days, but were pushed back in a battle about 40 kilometres away. A representative from the KNU says it's not easy to come here. They face a lot of difficulties with uh, blocking and intercepting. The KNU information could not be independently confirmed. A spokesperson for the military junta that seized power from an elected government back in 2021 did not answer calls from Reuters. And simmering anger against the junta turned into a nationwide armed resistance movement that's now increasingly operating in coordination with established ethnic rebel groups to challenge the military across large parts of Myanmar. And that same KNU spokesperson urged Myanmar's junta to see their recent military setbacks as a sign they should be handing back power to the people. He said, please don't waste time anymore. This is the time and a good opportunity to listen to the people first. Yeah, good luck with that one. We'll keep an eye on this uh, ongoing situation because it is now directly affecting people in Thailand and uh, that there right on the border between Mer Sot and Miawadi. Now, speaking of crossing the border in Thailand, we go to thepatianews.com. Thailand suspends filing of TM6 immigration form for land and sea arrivals. Now, you might remember this form. We used to have to fill it out on every flight to Thailand. Flight attendants would just casually walk around the cabin handing them out and there'd never be enough pens. But uh, those days were over, well, quite a few years ago. But now they're going to stop using the TM6 on land and sea borders as well. And it's effective from the 15th of April until the 15th of October this year at 16 land and sea checkpoints. And the Thai government suspended the requirement to fill out the TM6 immigration form for foreign travellers entering and exiting Thailand at 16 land and sea checkpoints from the 15th of April until the 15th of October. So I suppose we're seeing this as a six month trial and the six-month suspension of the TM6 form is aimed to ease immigration processes and alleviate congestion at eight checkpoints each for entry by land and sea. So just a little bit more pairing back of the immigration bureaucracy, and a lot of people would say, may that continue to happen? And still no news for those people that keep on asking me about uh, extending the visa exemption from 30 days to 45 or 90 days. Still no word about that. I think uh, at the moment the Immigration Department and Thai officials generally have just been, well, particularly busy with the hordes of tourists that have come over the first four months back to Thailand and, of course, the influx for Songkran. But uh, tomorrow everybody's back to work and uh, I suppose that will include you. I've worked all the way through. When do I get a day off? I probably don't. So please subscribe to the channel, that would really help. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.